This is episode number 140 of the Guns Magazine podcast. Hi there, and welcome to the Guns Magazine podcast. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Thanks for joining us as we talk to the interesting folks who make up the world of shooting, hunting, and the firearms industry. But first, before we get started, let's have a quick chat about our sponsor, 1791 Gun Leather. Centuries ago, the original patriots of this country fought and died for promises they protected in the Constitution. Chief among those promises was the right to bear arms. Generations later, 1791 now protects that right and our firearms. Makers of the 2020 Holster of the Year, the end results of every 1791 holster is a mastery of craft and function, customizable to any firearm you require. 1791 Gun Leather provides, in a way, only an American company can. For more information, visit 1791gunleather.com. In this episode, we're pulling back the curtain on something we get a lot of questions about. How do we write gun reviews? I'm talking to American Handgunner Editor Tom McHale, and we discuss how many barrels of cash the manufacturers send to us to write nice things, that would be none, and generally how the process works from start to finish. Now here's Tom McHale and how we do gun reviews. Good morning, Tom. Good morning. Well, thanks for joining me on what... uh, This is something I've been thinking about talking about for quite a while, and it's something we get letters. Uh, You are the editor of American Handgunner, of course, and I'm the editor of Guns Magazine. And I would say a couple times a month we get the letters, you know, how did you pick this gun? Why did you pick this gun? Why did you say that? Well, we're going to answer those questions today. We're going to pull the curtain back and show you there's Tom operating the levers and the big flame geysers and all that stuff, just like the Wizard of Oz. Should be fun. Yeah, man. Let's do it. Talk about reviews. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about the process and how we pick it and all that stuff. So I'm going to ask, the, you know, kind of the gorilla question in the room, or the white elephant question. Like I said, we get those emails, and, and we don't get a lot of them, but they say something to the effect, and you people are nothing but shills for the industry. Tom, how do you deal with those kind of accusations? Well, I think being forthright and truthful is really the best strategy with that. and I think. Um, What I like to do is clarify for any given gun story, whether I use the dead drop or a brush pass with the manufacturer. (laughs) Okay. And and what I mean by that is, um, you know, clearly what we all know is that manufacturers send large bags of unmarked cash to gun reviewers, you know, in exchange for good gun reviews. He admitted it right there, folks. So the question is, how do you get the money without (laughs) getting caught? You know, I like I like the brush pass because I always feel creepy, you know, going up to a dead drop where they've left the money. You know, you never know who's watching. Exactly. It, just, it always feels like a trap. There, right? There's a van sitting out there just watching it. Right. You don't know. You just don't know. So at <laughs> least, you know, with a brush pass, you're moving, you know, yeah. you exchange the backpack and you're on your way. You're wow. you're halfway running yeah. as it is. Right. So. <laughs> so, OK, are we done? We, we were being facetious. Tom was being facetious. <laughs> In case anybody is sarcasm impaired, Tom was being a bit facetious. If we got bags of money for gun reviews, both of us would be living in really, really nice houses. I, I have a nice house, but if I was getting wheelbarrows of money <laughs> delivered to my door for the gun reviews, oh, good Lord, I'd, I'd have a helipad oh. and I'd have a hot tub on my helipad. <laughs> Uh, no, it's fun, but you know, there is a, there is a lot to peel back here actually. So I, you know what, I think the biggest, let's, let's get into the biggest thing because I think I can safely speak for both of these magazines is neither of us are consumer reports, right? Would you agree with that? Absolutely. So I, I, I come to work every day viewing American handgunner as an educational and informative entertainment publication infotainment sometimes yeah infotainment i think is is a good word because i don't think they're mutually exclusive i think you can talk about things in an accurate uh objective way you can tell stories about your experience with products uh but you don't have to be dry you know it doesn't have to be science it doesn't have to be a 
you know, tables and tables of, of specifications, you know, yeah. uh, whether, whether somebody's going to like a particular handgun or not is a largely subjective experience. And so that's what we try and do. We try and convey the subjective feel of any given product, uh, combining it with, mm, I would say, well-packaged objective information. Exactly. You know, about performance attributes of a, of a given handgun. So and this is, um, I, I think this is very important background uh, to make the point that, yeah, a lot of the guns we write about are nice guns. And there's a very good reason for that. Right. I mean, how many how many articles in an average issue of American Handgunner uh, trash a firearm and, you know, spend all of those words going up and down about how awful and rotten it is? None. Zero. Really rare. You yeah. know why? You do know why. <laughs> so this is really a rhetorical question for, <laughs> for our listeners. It's no fun. It's no fun to write right. and it's no fun to read. So, you know, if there's a really rotten gun out there. We're not going to cover it. Who, who exactly. wants to buy a magazine to read about yeah. a piece of junk, right? This is the worst <laughs> piece of junk ever, and don't buy it. Well, then why did we spend 1,500 words telling you that? Exactly. You know, it's a waste many... of everyone's time. So, yeah. you know, I, I won't say if you don't see something in American Handgunner, you know, it's junk. You can't say that because there's a lot of guns out there. But if you don't see something in the magazine uh, that, that is deemed to be junk by the industry. Maybe there's a reason for that. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, all right. And, you know, being legitimate and honest, um, that's not always the case at every publication and certainly not online. We've all seen it, you know, the, a gun that, you know, is maybe sketchy or something that is wrong about it, but you hear a glowing review, uh, you mm -hmm. know, the best gun ever. I mean, we've seen that kind of stuff and, to me, as a just a consumer and reader, if I see something that says it's the fan, most fantastic ever in the history of mankind, I'm suspicious. But I'll also say when I see there's nothing good about this gun there, you know, it's like if you're going to that much trouble to trash something, I, I'm wondering about your objectivity. So, again, like you said, we try to kind of take the middle ground here that we're not going to intentionally trash stuff. We're going to try and tell you if there's something you need to know. But. It's I've also found it's really easy to write a trash story, you know, if mm -hmm. if you just want to focus on the negative. But like you said, that that gets really tiresome after a while. It's like, geez, did did you find anything decent about this gun at all? And some folks don't. And unfortunately, many of our friends in the YouTube world, uh, that's their first go to. You know, oh, this is a piece yeah. of this will get you killed. Really? <laughs> um, OK, exactly. Uh, if a guy's been in, you know, 160 gunfights, I, I may believe that. If a guy has never pointed a firearm at somebody, but he's telling you that, I always kind of wonder. But anyway. Yep. So really, what is your general philosophy of what a gun review should be in our magazines? I want to I want to put in words the experience of not only handling a gun at the gun store, but taking it to the range multiple times. Uh, shooting for fun, shooting for science, and uh, we'll we'll get into that a little bit uh, later. But I want somebody to to really feel what that's about. So I I try and do something a little a little different with every new gun that that comes out. I step back, I look at it, you know, I start evaluating it, and I I try and figure out why does this gun exist? Mm -hmm. What is unique about it that would made it made it worthy of the time, effort, and investment for somebody to produce this, put get it out on store shelves and start selling this thing. Right. What is different? Yeah, and that's that's kind of a maybe that's my my marketing puke background. But <laughs> um, you know, that's kind of how I look at things. Like, okay, why is this here? Why why do you why do you take up oxygen? I guess they don't yeah. really do that, but you know, on this earth. And and so I always look for that angle first. Well, let's get to the question that we often get asked and accused of sometimes. How much input does the manufacturer get? Now, we're not talking sponsored content. If you see that someplace, they've they've paid for it. And that's why we put that up there that, you know, you need to understand that they are sponsoring this particular piece of content. But a, a regular firearms review in any of our publications that just, you know, by Will Dabbs or Brent Weed or Tom McHale, how much input does the manufacturer get? Zero. No, and, I, and, and no, and I really mean that. And yeah. I, that's not a bad thing. That's not a that's not a hard nosed thing. That's just a 
a reality of doing business in volume. And, yeah. and I think this discussion is going to lead into how this whole process of a, a gun going from a manufacturer to a gun writer really works. And, and let, let, so let's drill into this thing. Um, you know, I get a, I hear about a, a new gun coming out. Some manufacturers will hold, you know, briefings where they'll tell us the specs of this thing and what's, um, you know, what it's going to be. We'll see a picture or two. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then one day it, it shows up in the mail. Uh, there is no person handholding. There's no packet of information with that gun that, that says, you know, here's here's what you need to say about this. Yeah. And here's what it is. Most times with a new gun, I don't even have a spec sheet. Yeah. So what I have is an object in a case that I have to figure out. Now, <laughs> don't get me wrong. I'm not complaining. I love right. this, you know, um, and a lot of a, kind of a shocking amount of time is spent making sure I for lack of a better word, reverse engineer the features that it does have (laughs) correctly. You know, I take it apart, I look at it and I I look. And so I kind of have to rewrite the spec sheet based on what I say. That's not a bad thing. That's good. I'm just making the point that there is no, there is no cheat sheet. There's no guide. There's nothing, you know, that, that comes with that gun. I got to figure it out. I like that. Well, here's the shocker. Last night I had a cleaning session. I put a bunch of guns out in my garage, set up the table and did things in mass. And we, there's a new gun I can't talk about. It's one of those double top secret guns. I had to get the manual out to figure out exactly how to take it apart. You I didn't. Yeah. You I, did I not could've... read the instructions. Oh, yeah. yeah. I could have sussed no. it out and it was pretty much what I thought. But when you're talking a brand new gun, you know, I didn't want to call them the manufacturer back and go, Hey, I, I broke this trying to get it apart. So, you know, we're the same as anybody. Well, I'm, I'm busting your chops because when a, when a new gun does have a manual, they don't always, you know, right. if it's really new, you, you may get the manual for the previous similar ish model. Um, I do often break out the manual. You yeah. know, I want to know you have to. Uh, what's in there and why. Um, so yep. it's, it's part of the, part of the learning process to understand what, what a particular gun is and what it's all about and how it's, how it's designed to function. So after the story is written, then we send it to the manufacturer for review, right? (laughs) Never, ever, ever, ever. 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 That is the one thing I have never once done ever. Did I say ever, never, ever, ever. ever, Oh my gosh. And uh, you know, boy, talk about a can of worms. Can you imagine? Uh, bouncing, bouncing. I don't even send stories back to our writers, right. you know, for, for that <laughs> bouncing, bouncing stuff back and forth. No, no, they don't see it until, until it shows up on the newsstand. So well, having worked in the marketing world, as you have too, can you ever imagine a situation where you would send a story to a manufacturer and they'd go, that's perfect. We love it. That would never happen. No, we need this <laughs> nope. and you need to add that and change <laughs> you need it. to talk about this feature. Exactly. And this demographic. Uh, yeah, no, that would make my life miserable yeah. actually. You may think they get to review and just, again, from a practical standpoint, we would spend our entire time chasing down and rewriting stories because their needs and our needs are completely two different things. So uh, there is no review process. Again, if uh, we're talking not sponsored content, if it's sponsored content, they're paying for it. They get a right to look at it and blah, blah, blah. But we clearly delineate that. But And, and to be clear, in an average, I don't, you know, I won't speak for yours, but in handgunner. Or- uh, there are no sponsored articles. I'm, right. I'm not saying it couldn't happen. If it, yeah. if we ever did one, you'd see it and it would be clearly say, but none of the stories are sponsored content. You know, we have sections like new products, which are, that's an announcement section. That's not a review section that just has a little paragraph under new products so people can yep. see what they are. But yeah, that's an important distinction. I'll bring again, not in guns or handgunner, but we do have on our websites, uh, yep. working on a couple projects that way. But just want to make that clear. And I will say, not all of our friends in the industry do it like we are doing it. Um, You know, we've both had experiences where there were discussions of, you know, if we buy this much advertisement, how much love do we get from editorial? And Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we try to work with our partners because if we don't, we don't have a magazine, so it's a moot point. But we never get to the point of it's a one for one trade out or a quid pro quo. Um, it's a, I guess, would you call it a gentleman's agreement? If you've got a good product and you send it to us, we'll review it in good faith and hopefully uh, folks will buy it and everybody's happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, what we should talk about for a minute is the, the real process. One of the myths I hear most is, um, you know, how we get handpicked guns, you know, <laughs> from, from the secret room and, yeah. 
you know, a team of white coated engineers, you know, meticulously inspect and go through the gun that shows that's going to show up on my doorstep. <laughs> we, sh- we should talk about sure. the reality of that process for a minute. Yeah. And, and it probably has happened a- at times, but uh, you'd be shocked at the number of review guns that we get that are very early in the production process. And then it's like, oh, so you do call the manufacturer and say, hey, uh, this, you know, oh, yeah, well, yeah, we're changing that design before we release it. It's like, OK, that probably well, a good thing. Well, if you stop and you, even a production gun, you know, you stop and you think about how the process has to work because we're talking volume here. If you've ever right. been to a gun factory, even a small manufacturer, you walk into a room and there are thousands and thousands and thousands of parts and guns and assembled in boxes and outgoing shipments. So, you know, when when a review gun is getting lined up to come to me, uh, the process looks kind of like this. You know, I call or email somebody in a PR agency or maybe a marketing person and they're in some city somewhere. Right. Uh, they say, great. Let, you know, we're thrilled that you're going to do a story like that. And they enter an order in their computer and that order pops up on a printer and then a computer in a factory in some other city somewhere. <laughs> and some guy or girl who has no idea who I am or what, because my name's not on it. It's a, going to an FFL somewhere. Right. right? They slap a shipping label on there and says, hey, this, you know, this one needs to go to Joe's Firearms in, you know, South Carolina. Right. Yeah. Uh, That's it. Then I go pick it up. You know, there is there is no (laughs) no hand holding process going on here. So uh, with production guns, I feel pretty confident that uh, we get what you get. So exactly. So moving on down that line is so how do we select which guns we're going to get. You kind of addressed it, but, but go a little further into how I figure out the next four or five guns we're going to review, you know, in the next issue. Yeah, there's definitely um, art and science mixed together there. You know, I think, um, you know, me, I like to, I like to look for unique attributes. Is there something new and different about this compared to another? And, and granted we're talking handguns, right? They all shoot center fire or sometimes rim fire cartridges and, launch a projectile in the forward direction if all goes to plan, right? <laughs> so so there's only so much difference you can talk about, but I, I look for uniqueness. I look for something new. I look for newsworthiness. You know, is this um, for some reason going to set the world on fire? Is this uh, uh, going to interest our readers? You know, there's there's some subjective call yeah. in, uh, in what it is we're going to talk about. But, you know, the bottom line is our loyalty is to the readers. So yeah. I want a gun either on the cover or, you know, in the interior feature pages, that's going to be interesting and fun to read about that. People are going to say, Hey, I'm, I might be interested in buying that, you know, or boy, I'd love to have one of those someday. Right. And a lot of times it's the writers, uh, our staff writers say, Hey, I heard Mm -hmm. about this cool new gun. Do you guys want a story on it? And then we work with them on it. Well, I was, I was actually talking to, uh, one of our writers, uh, on a chat yesterday and, and, um, we, he was, going to do work with uh, a a certain manufacturer, you know, on on an existing model that's been out for a while. And there are several models. And I said, you know what I want you to do? I want you to pick the one that lights your fire. You know, that's going to be the best story. Right. Yep. That, and that's what we want. Uh, you know, I had a, a question here. How do we select who writes? Well, um, if it's the writer writing in, obviously they get the story and then we just kind of pick somebody that'll fit. But I think the key is just what you just touched on of, I want somebody that I can, I know from our experience of is going to be so excited about that gun and we'll do something mm-hmm. not the same as everybody. I went to the range at 20 yards, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. That's part of the process. But you know, I like dabs, I think dabs is a great example of that. He always comes up with some, I don't want to say strange, but unusual and <laughs> angle on things, and, but that's, what's cool. And that's why. I and the readers really like to read what he what he has to say. So that's that's my goal for our magazine and is for you. Of We want stories. We want stories. We're not consumer digest. We want stories yeah. about guns and about the lifestyle and what you can do with the guns and the fun you have with guns. And mm-hmm. our loyalty lies with the reader. Yeah. Yep. OK, so the next big question, and I get this all the time. So do you. Do we get free guns every day? <laughs> no, 
No. As a, as a matter of fact, what I do get Darn every it. day are reminder emails and invoices. <laughs> Please ship back, yeah. <laughs> to send them back or buy them. Yeah, and those invoices are at MSRP. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait a minute how do you get msrp minor or msrp time plus 30 percent oh okay huh? well uh, probably that too but no that, i'm i'm kidding of course but um no that's um that doesn't happen yeah it does happen <laughs> once in a while and we certainly yeah. appreciate it i've had that happen a couple of times where i've reviewed a gun and call them and say hey you know ready to send this back i need a shipping label and they're like just hang on to it I'm like really but that's only happened a few times in the four years I've been at the helm. So mm-hmm. we were people too. I certainly appreciate that, but it doesn't happen very often. Now, the thing that generally, and this is a benefit to being a gun writer, all you budding gun writers out there, a lot of times you can do what's called a buyout. So they will give you a decent price, sometimes a great price, but usually a fair price on the gun after you've done a review and you say, Hey, I want to, I want to keep this. And, uh, They'll send you a price and you write them a check and there you go. And to me, that is a huge compliment. If the the gun writer is basically spending the money he makes on writing the story, on purchasing the gun, I mean, it's a kind of a net zero for him. He ends up with a gun, but he didn't make any money off of it. But that just shows, you know, he really liked that gun. Mm -hmm. So I bought guns. You've bought guns. I got a gun here. I'm going to buy soon. (laughs) And there you go. (laughs) <laughs> that's actually the danger of doing what we do. It's like at the end of the year, it's like, I've got some Where'd that cool- paycheck. Go? Huh? Exactly. <laughs> you know, the, the, the mortgage company still wants their payment every month and they don't understand, <laughs> but I got this really cool gun. So, so anyway, put that to rest. Yes. Occasionally we get free guns and mo- more often we can buy them if we choose, but, uh, there's no, n- I will say never, ever, ever. They go, if you write this, we're going to send you that gun for free never happened yeah. i would be really uncomfortable with that because that just tells me there's too many strings attached something's and wrong exactly exactly so again it's a big industry and i can't speak for every single human being involved in the industry but that's pretty much the way it runs all the quote unquote legitimate outlets i'm familiar with well we've talked about how we get to this point but let's talk about the actual review itself whether Masad Ayub or Tom McHale's doing a story. You got a gun in hand and you need to put together 2,000 words. How do you do it? Go, right? Go. <laughs> Load the truck, head to the range. Yeah, it's a, it's a process. I mean, you know, the first thing is the, I'll call it the, the gun counter plus experience, you know, I take <laughs> it out of the box. I look at it and I, I kind of figure the thing out, you know, work the action. Um, I, I will field strip it right away. You know, there's, Some writers uh, from various places who get off on taking it straight to the range without lubrication and this and that. And that's supposed to tell you something like, no, I, I think I'd rather replicate the experience of if I, you know, just bought this one in a store, uh, how would I treat it? You know, and, and my first trip to the range, so I'll take it apart and field strip it. And if it's clearly pre lubed and ready to go from the factory, I won't do anything to it. I'll put it back together and it'll be ready to shoot. Um, you know, some guns, there are some guns, they'll, you know, put a little special grease on the rails or something for a break in process. And there are others that might've come from a previous reviewer yeah, that, uh, that are dried out and got nothing on them or dirty, you know? Um, so, you know, I'll kind of look at it and do what I think needs to be done as if I had just, uh, bought this thing, you know, I do want to take it apart and make sure it's functional and, and check all that stuff first. I, you know, before I even go to the range, I spent a lot of time with the trigger. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll clear the ammo and do all the safety stuff and, and I will, I'll, you know, spend 15, 20, 30 minutes just messing around with the trigger, measuring the weight, kind of getting measuring, you know, what's the take up like, is there grit, you know, I'll kind of hold the gun up Mm -hmm. beside my head, muzzle pointed at a safe place, you know, right next to my ear, basically. And uh, operate the trigger a whole bunch of times just to feel and hear, you know, what's going on with the take up the, you know, the, um, the actual break and the, the reset afterwards. So uh, I will spend a lot of time with that before the first range trip. Mm-hmm. What about you? Are you a trigger guy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I call it fondle time. I sit at my desk. <laughs> <laughs> and I fondle, I get a feel for, you know, I want to know, I, I'm, a, I'm big on ergonomics, whether it's a pistol or a long gun, you know, just how does it feel? 
How does it feel to, you know, carry? How does it feel to operate? Uh, I do the trigger stuff. I, I do the sights a lot. Uh, if it's a long gun, I run the action in different ways, see if I can, you know, short stroke it or it binds any place. Basically, probably to me, the, the biggest problem with writing a gun review is, to be totally honest, we ought to carry it for five years in the field yeah. and do everything with it. But it yeah. doesn't work that way. You know, we're not bourbon. We can't wait that long. So right. I, I really try to get a good sense of more than just out to the range on the firing line. And I can tell you what it grouped. I want to know, does it you know feel good? Does it feel heavy? Does it ride in the holster? Well, is it is it a natural point of aim when you when you throw it up? Is the length of pull too long for me? That's very subjective. But, uh, you know, just all those little things that you will notice, you know, as, as a avid hunter. I've often realized one of the best ways to review a gun, of course, is going in the field, but it's not the shooting of the game. It's sitting there for hours on end and looking down and realizing that safety is not placed well. Or, mm -hmm. you know, this uh, the finish on this gun is just not holding up to field conditions. So short of taking a gun in the field for, you know, a long period of time, the best I can do is fondle. So that's my fondle time at the uh, the <laughs> desk. Some guns will get two or three fondle sessions until I really feel like I, <laughs> this sounds zen, but I understand the gun. Yeah, I, it makes a difference. I mean, before you before you get to the range. So ab absolutely, I do the same thing. And I, during that process, I'll also, you know, do the, the close-up inspection. Yeah. You know, what's the fit and finish if it's, you know, got grip panels and steel and joints and or wood and all that stuff. I'll see, you know, how much care and detail was put into the assembly and finishing process you know yep. does everything match up like it should and uh, uh, stuff like that so i'll look for machining marks where they are and where they aren't you know yep uh, and, and 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 you do have to be careful with a lot of you have to be careful what the gun is you're looking at you know yeah. if it's a gun intended to be sold in volume and it's an intended to be affordable i'm going to expect to see you know more rough stuff in places where it doesn't matter Absolutely. and that's okay you yeah. know you're paying for that Taurus and Nighthawk occupied two different niches in the world. So mm -hmm. you, you know, if you're paying $5,000 for a 1911 from Nighthawk, you will expect a higher level of, of all that. So that's the kind of stuff we have to look for. I want, I want the doors to make that satisfying click on a, <laughs> on an expensive gun, you know, and yeah. on, on a, uh, affordable production gun. I want it to work. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, as far as the range itself goes, um, I mean, it's pretty standard. You go out, you shoot it, you check function, operation, make sure, you know, it doesn't blow up. Um, to check some accuracy. Now, <clears throat> personally, and I will say this is personal because opinions are all over the board on it. I, I'm not a big fan of I want to see every single bullet tested on a chronograph and tables and tables of charts. I realize some folks really like that. But I tell my writers, just just hit the high points in the body of the story, and we're not going to do a, a a chart. Your thoughts on that, Tom? I yeah. know you are different I, geek wise. I am, but I also, in terms of what I'm going to publish, I, I, you know, when I'm testing a gun myself, I do chronograph the ammo just mainly for the records. Mm -hmm. Do I really care if out of manufacturer X model A, I get 1120 feet per second and manufacturer Y model B, I get 1124. Do I <laughs> yeah. care? Yeah. Does it matter? Is, does, has the world changed? No. Yeah. You know, but, uh, but I'll, I'll grab it and document it. We don't do charts and tables either. What I do care about, and I uh, put a lot of energy into and uh, expose some pet peeves is accuracy. Yes. You know, that's one of the things that uh, clearly ammo is the big variable, but um, that distinguishes a lot of guns from each other. So what I care about most is making sure I take me or the reviewer out of the equation as much as possible. So to, let's put that in perspective. When I read a review somewhere that says, yeah, I tested accuracy of this gun by standing there one handed at 25 yards <laughs> and firing groups, you know, yeah. you, no, you're, you're not telling me anything about the accuracy of the gun. You're trying to brag about your shooting skills, exactly. right? <laughs> so, you know, you got to, you got to eliminate all the variables. If, if you're going to talk to me about accuracy of a gun and, and I actually put a lot of effort into that, you know, depending on the configuration model of the gun, I'll put a scope on a lot of handguns ah. to completely, I mean, you can do ransom rest, but sure. then you got the whole grip fitting and custom inserts and all that stuff. 
Um, you put a scope on a handgun and you can shoot, you know, half well, you're going to know what that gun and ammo combination can do under ideal scenarios. Yep. So. I like Masad Ayub and uh, he came up with the test and I think it's pretty accurate. You fire a five shot group, take your three best. And that typically, you know, that mm-hmm. that's giving the shooter two throws. Uh, but generally the, the tightest three will be a pretty good indication of, of how accurate the gun is. So that's not a bad yeah, for <laughs> iron sight scenarios. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Especially because, um, you know, you're looking iron sights, you're, you're talking about a very, very, very small misalignment with your eyeball at yep. the bench translates into a, a fraction of an inch, you know, at the range. Yep. Um, I mean, I can't tell you how many guns you shoot with iron sights. You get one size group and you put a scope rail on that thing or a red oh, dot, right. uh, take out most of the sighting error and the group shrinks in half. Exactly. So the first time we really didn't learn much about the gun, did we? Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm sorry to say I, I've actually uh, declined to use riders because either I don't believe that they're getting a quarter inch group offhand at 25 or <laughs> the one I'm thinking of in particular, his shooting was pretty awful. And <laughs> I, I was embarrassed to, you know, use the photos because uh, it's dude, you know, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but you have to have a little bit of skill here. Well, what you do is you do you go to one shot groups. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah. So, yeah, those work out pretty well most times, most times. Exactly. But I'm not resorting to hyperbole here. We've got the best world class experts on our staff. Um, I I don't think they're second to none. And I I don't take any credit for that. A lot of them were here long before I got here. But uh, uh, again, you're talking hundreds of years of shooting experience. Yeah. But I just thinking as you're talking about that, I would say about half of our regular writers are gunsmiths. Yeah. And that really provides an interesting take. You know, we're we're working on a story right now. Same gun, two different stories. One of them's going to be, you know, a look at the gun itself. And the next one's going to be, okay, one of our our writer slash gunsmiths is going to take a hammer file and welder uh, to this brand new pistol (laughs) and make it into a custom masterpiece. Okay, you want to know what what's inside a production gun? Do that. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Wow. Well. When we're talking about reviews, how do we handle problems? And this just came up recently in, in a team meeting we had. Uh, we get a gun that, that just doesn't work. Uh, how do we handle that? Just like our listeners do. And, you know, I'll go through. No, I mean that seriously. No, I wasn't we'll sure where you were going self, with that. <laughs> no, the self-diagnosis first. Like, yeah. did I do something, even inadvertently, like, uh, you know, one of the, the issue we were talking about now, you know, had to do with uh, mounting an accessory. And we figured out real quick that, hmm, you know, I've seen talking as a group, we've seen um, uh, screws, you know, and sometimes screws come with an optic. Sometimes they come with a gun. Sometimes they come with a third party plate manufacturer. They're not always the right size, you know. So is that a gun problem? No. You know, that's just the wrong screw. So, uh, you know, you run into things like that. But once you once you clear out the obvious, I'm reluctant to say operator error because but there are just things that we all you know, miss right. and overlook and oops, didn't realize that would impact that. You know, mm-hmm. um, I, I pick up the phone and I call <laughs> what I'd like to do. I'd like to call the, you know, just call the manufacturer direct. So I'm just average Joe calling in from the street, you know, what's, yep. what's going on. So, um, and there have been some cases where, you know, uh, there was a, a gun a while back we reviewed and, uh, uh, they actually learned something from the experience. Yeah. It, it wasn't compatible with a certain type of ammo. It didn't feed it well because of the bullet profile. Is that a problem with the gun? Eh, maybe, maybe not, depending on your viewpoint. You know, they can't make everything fit everything, but, uh, you know, we all learned something. So. Well, Tom, this is a subject we could talk about for a long time because it's what we do every day. But I, I hope we've answered some of the, the uh, common questions our readers have and Maybe one or two of the accusations we get, but um, <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'm the happiest little boy in America. I've got the greatest job, and I think you'd say the exact same thing, but uh, I hope we do what you said is we're serving our readers, and that yep. truly is what we get up and try to do every day. Yep. Both uh, these magazines have been around for a long time, so uh, if, if we foul up that, that process, uh, we'll know. Well, Tom, thanks for joining me. And now we got to get back to committing journalism. There you go. Thanks for having me. (laughs) 
As always, Tom was full of fun and information, and hopefully you now have a better understanding of how we really put gun reviews together. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening to the Guns Magazine podcast. Guns Magazine was first on the newsstand, and today we're bringing you the most interesting chats in the gun world. If you've got questions or comments about the show, please email me. That would be editor at gunsmagazine.com. Make sure you subscribe to us on your favorite podcast directory, YouTube, and of course, you can always listen to us at gunsmagazine.com. And while you're online, don't forget to check out our great sister publications, American Handgunner Magazine at AmericanHandgunner.com, AmericanCop.com, and our numerous special editions available for sale on our websites. Most of all, while you're online, I'd really appreciate it if you'd also share a favorite episode or some kind words on your own social media. Well, that's it for this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. For the entire staff at FMG Publications, I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Now get out there and get shooting. Get shooting.